Good morning, YouTubers. I just wanted to go over quickly a little bit about what my recent videos have covered in case you're interested, since you're in the neighborhood, right? I'm your tour guide. I've gotten more into talking about social issues, you could call them, like racism and alcoholism, or just what is the role of you know, that's more than just beer. I talked about Quakers as an ethnicity and my own relationship to the beer world, which is always a balancing act in terms of weight and other things. Um, I, I like that we're talking about Baltimore. That's the, the silver lining in today's news, right? We're pick, we've picked up on the idea that we can talk about cities and it's the loud argument format that always disturbs me because I don't think that the the revolution, as Fuller talked about it, and if you're new to my blogs, it's always a lot about Bucky Fuller, right? And he didn't want to play Robin Hood about, you know, big transfer of wealth and the whole heroism of bringing down the rich. Nor was he interested in a big massive worker rebellion or something along those lines. He wasn't really into social Darwinism, either on the Marxist side or on the so-called oligarch side, although he did attack, he was polemical, he wasn't just a wallflower either. So he's an interesting writer, and that's what I try to keep getting across, is I think if we're going to make progress in Baltimore or anything else, the Asylum City memes, I wish I wasn't stuck in a commercial here. I was going to show you more of that video, but I feel like I'm frustrated at the moment by the commercial there. We'll just skip that. So, yeah, um, city planning. See, my dad was a city planner. He started here in Portland after getting his degree at the University of Chicago. We grew up here as a young family, but he always hankered to go overseas and have a more adventurous lifestyle. When the opportunity arose, he took it and moved a family to Rome, which was hardly a step down from Portland. as a lateral step to a different world for me. But uh, he got to work with Libya and do big, long-range plans, right? Like, there's almost nothing in the Sahara Desert except small oasis communities, but you can see where they would develop over time, and zoning makes a difference. Oregon's had some strong planning compared to some other states, and it helps... It's kind of like planned growth because you know what you're doing and why. Intra introducing human intelligence into the picture is supposed to be a good thing to do. And I think one way to withdraw it from the picture is to indulge in what the Aspensky people are calling, I'm looking for my orange covered book here, uh, what the Aspensky people call negative, negative emotion, right? And... And uh, Maurice Nicole, see, I've been introducing him lately, and like if you go back in just a couple, three videos, I actually have Maurice Nicole's book. Because I'm making the argument once again, A, Fuller's an interesting writer because he's not predictably Robin Hoodie or um, tyrannical capitalist. He's found an interesting middle way, I think, that's focused on engineering. But he's a writer. He's in the humanities. So I'm trying to say synergetics is into the humanities, and I'm linking it to mind dynamic kind of stuff, psychological stuff. And I think this accounts a lot for Applewhite's interest in the whole project, because he's uh, psychology-oriented. He told me this. And so also, just to make it more concrete, this book, A Love of Discovery, edited by my friend Bob Fuller, by Robert Carplus, um, this has been on my mind because it's about how do we teach stuff from the ground up. And I don't say you have to be um, a little kid to, to get it from the beginning all over, like there's this thing we call rebirth or getting reborn or whatever. You're ready to trade, trade in your current mode of suffering for some new mode of suffering. I have this Callahan type picture in my head, a comic, edgy comic of some guy with a cross on his back coming to the exchange it for another one please store. You're always going to have this cross on your back, but time to mix it up a little maybe. Anyway, that's kind of what mind dynamics helps with. 
is becoming disidentified with things that are just sucking you down. You know, you've kind of been eaten by an identity. And now it's going to drag you to the bottom unless you can disidentify. And once you learn more or less how to identify and disidentify, that gives you that kind of freedom partly that you crave actually and that you need. And so it becomes, once you start to learn the skills, the idea is it becomes more and more essential that you keep learning more because you won't be able to be your old self and survive in your new um, job, you could put it that way, right? Yeah, you just have to keep getting more adept. And that's a good position to be in because it's something you can do on yourself as opposed to screaming about liberals and Democrats and Republicans and conservatives and all these people out here who refuse to do anything about Baltimore. It's easy to get mad, and that's working on yourself to get mad, which is, like, I don't find that a promising direction for me, and I, because I want to do more like what Bucky wanted to do. I want to do a cool-headed, um, a smooth transition to where we're using our technology responsibly for ourselves as human beings. We, we have wonderful intelligence. We have beautiful technology. We have one and only one promised land planet. Why is religion about anything other than let's take advantage of this window of opportunity not to blow ourselves up where one superpower decides winner take all. That's what people are thinking, huh, maybe this is the time to do the big one, right? And I'm like, the big one we need to do, and it is a big one, is to properly apply our technology on behalf of all of us. And I got into a big kind of crazy fight on a physics community teachers list because this energy slave is what they say uh, totally triggering, right? It's got the word slave in it. And we have an ugly history, I guess you could say. But history is ugly. I don't deny it. It's a horror show, you know. Along those lines, this was a pretty good video. I liked Abby's approach. She's not loud and angry. She's not shouting. She's got her points. Everyone says she's on the left. But this is like a scholarly thing where we're just discussing a guy's book. And all he's trying to tell people is that... The identity of the United States has been variable. It always has been. It's like climate change in a way. People are like, oh, you can't mess around with that. But, you know, when did they start calling it America? Just America and mean the lower 48 kind of what? You know, what is that? You know, because it was territories from the beginning, states and territories that together made the United States. So this dichotomy of you're just a territory uh, you're not a, you're not a state yet, so we can te treat you badly because you're not equals yet. You have to prove yourselves, and then we'll let you in. You'll be in the union, and then we'll treat you like citizens. And that's the big dichotomy we have now. There's citizens, and then there's undocumented, which is like whose responsibility is to document anyway. And of course, we're going to say governments, but I'm like, can't a university document people too somehow? It's like. If I were a university, I would have a network of safe house, safe campuses. I would call them safe campuses, and you could go there. And it would be a huge headache for us if we had no help from the rest of the world because everyone would go there because the rest of the world is hell. And we wouldn't want that kind of voltage differential. But we do want to make our campuses livable, and we don't want to turn people away who are suffering. So the universities would suddenly really need to upgrade the curriculum big time, right? Because, oh my God, how are we going to take care of this actual problem, the campus? And I'm thinking that could have a good driver effect on curriculum improvements. We'd be thinking about how to upgrade our engineering to do something better than a tent, but not necessarily a mobile home. Surely in the great space of possibility that technology offers, including the aerospace sector, including Elon Musk, including the Tesla cars, including all the battery technologies, everything we have, can we not conceive of dwelling solutions that are not on that spectrum between a trailer or mobile home in Florida and a tent on a sidewalk somewhere? Uh, there's, there's big apartments all along the coast, the Gulf Coast down there, that's just drive straight, and we just have view apartments. But, you know, people need um, a lifestyle. They need a way to live. And we're trying to talk about that in a shouting headway 
when we talk about Baltimore or any big city, Flint, Detroit, Portland. Let's talk about cities. I'm all for it. Let's talk about Robert Moses, urban planning, zoning, uh, the history. Even before we're like, and some, somewhere we got to start sneaking in some hopeful, hist uh, hopeful futurism. I think you have to have hopeful futurism. It's a requirement. It's like in your diet, if it's not there, you're going to have suffering. And so television, screenwriters, how are you going to do some smart, smart, us being smart and having a good future as science fiction? Because it's not here yet. We're living in the pits. It's a ghetto planet. But how did we get out of it? Can we please see a hopeful story or two or three or more, right? Show us how we did it. How did we get out of this, okay? Not a crazy thing to ask for, because that would require, actually, you could do it based on kind of like, don't forget about the Bucky Fuller stuff. He's like handing it to you on a plate. Here, floating cities, old man river, everything comes from the sun. It's a lot about that in the Spensky books, too. All right, well, that's all I'm saying. If you want TV to help and get you out of this sinkhole, get you out of this mud, you need a better screenwriter. Uh, um, a screenwriter motivated to show you some hopeful futurism so that all these shouting heads can like settle down and look at the past more deeply, more analytically, more coldly, which just means without getting so upset you have to stop. Uh, keep studying right on through this, right? Don't let words like energy slave throw you off. That was a positive thing in the 40s. People were saying, hey, we don't have to exploit each other. I don't need to depend on you. I won't ride on your back. You won't ride on mine. We'll both ride on the back of this metallic machine. It's not a threat to us. It's liberating to us. And this is a proper attitude towards machinery. That's what we look for with automation. Take the drudgery out of my life. I need to focus. I need to do my homework. I need to do my research. How am I going to learn math if every time I sit down, something has to, I have to get up again and do something. I have to cook somebody a breakfast. I have to do, you know, and that's not even hard, right? I mean, you got kids pushed out on the street to go beg for a few coins, selling flowers to tourists. That's not learning math. And then we say, like, oh, they need to learn math. Well, okay, you see where I'm going with this. You need to give people space to study. And automation can help with that. A vast cafeteria can feed a huge number of people without the marginal costs are much less when you cook in bulk for large groups. So I think the campus has a lot going for it already. So I am in favor of making asylum cities look a lot like a university campus. Maybe indistinguishable, okay, in some cases. That's what they will be. They will be prototype campus of some university. Go there and live like someone might in the future, and immediately it becomes a testing ground for new technologies. That's the point. We want it to do that. That's why we're giving out degrees is because you, you did some serious work. All right, we're not just giving them out. Talk to you soon.